Pardon? Sorry. So, yeah, this is uh, the CP about a uh, comparative study on measurement of neutralizing antibody SARS-CoV-2 serology testing against PRNT. So, Professor Amin, uh, your 30 minutes, the time is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lia Hartakusuma. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, a very good morning to all of uh, you, all participants. First of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to uh, share with you uh, just small small data actually because this, this is uh, still uh, very, very preliminary. Please allow me to sh uh, share screen with you. Okay, this is the title of my presentation, Comparative Study on Measurement of Neutralizing Antibody Activity, uh, SARS-CoV-2 Serology Testing versus uh, PRNT. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that uh, most of you are familiar with this graph. Uh, this is just to uh, remind uh, everybody uh, about the dynamic of uh, uh, some parameters uh, during the course of uh, COVID-19 infection yeah, from the RNA and the gen and also uh, the dynamic of uh, IgG as well as IgM. Uh, of course, we understand that uh, uh, IgM uh, appear at, uh, before IgG, but IgG will last for a longer time. And uh, during uh, yeah, in the in the following discussion, we will discuss uh, more about IgG antibody. Um, if you are talking about uh, uh, antibody uh, anti-COVID, yeah, or actually in general, also like this, actually we we could uh, expect uh, at least uh, for scenario, yeah. Uh, the scenario A is, uh, for example, in the brown line, uh, the antibody will raise uh, immediately after infection or after uh, exposure to uh, uh, the microbes or after vaccination uh, will increase and will last for yeah uh, quite a long time. And uh, scenario B, uh, similar to A, but uh, the level is a little bit higher. So that's why uh, if we measure the antibody after the uh, vaccination, there are uh, some uh, uh, quite significant variation between one individual and the other individual. Also, uh, we could have uh, scenario C and D where uh, in C, for example, at the beginning, the level of antibody was uh, very high, but uh, after uh, relatively short period, the level decreased uh, significantly. And uh, also we observe uh, the scenario D uh, where antibody raise uh, only uh, very limited and still below protective uh, line. Yeah. And then uh, disappear or decrease uh, significantly. So, uh, um, we actually we need to uh, understand uh, why uh, some individual uh, even after uh, completing the vaccination to uh, doses of vaccination uh, they still uh, could be infected by the virus um, talking about the antibody uh, itself Actually, uh, if we measure total antibody, it it is not necessarily uh, uh, reflect the neutralizing antibody as uh, depicted in this uh, uh, graph. Um, the blue line represent uh, uh, anti uh, IgG immunoglobulin G, probably total IgG. But uh, uh, if we compare to the uh, black line, 
this black line is really represent the neutralizing antibody. So we could see that uh, neutralizing antibody is probably only part of the IgG. Yeah. So if we measure only IgG, probably uh, we could uh, <clears throat> see the uh, titer is quite high, but actually uh, the titer of neutralizing antibody is not as uh, that high. Uh, of course, IgM will uh, disappear in, in relatively short uh, period. So we will concentrate to this uh, neutralizing antibody yeah, in the uh, following discussion. Uh, <clears throat> why neutralizing antibody is uh, uh, important? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> if we uh, um, correlate the antibody with the vaccination itself, uh yeah we could see if uh the vaccine consists of uh, say a whole virus uh, <clears throat> probably the the we <clears throat> sorry there we uh, uh several type of antibody uh elicite if antibody is directly to the rbd receptor binding domain part of the s uh, protein so we could see that uh the antibody is specific uh, for RBD, it could bind, bind the virus and also it could neutralize the uh, virus. Yeah. But if uh, the antibody is uh, directed not to the RBD, but to part of the uh, S protein, for example, so it could, it could still bind the uh, virus, but probably the neutralizing effect is uh, uh, not as strong as the, the first example. Yeah, if the antibody is directed to the uh, nu uh, capsid protein, the end protein, so uh, it could not bind the, the virus and also it could not uh, neutralize the virus because it is directly to the uh, nuclear capsid. Uh, of course, uh, antibody against uh, N protein could still have uh, effect on the, uh, protecting our body because uh, it will bind to the nucleic capsid and also uh, after that it will prevent uh, the uh, genetic material to, uh, from uh, from the uh, releasing to the uh, inside the cell. Okay, uh, this is another uh, uh, example. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so if we compare uh, vaccination with whole virus and uh, with uh, PLP, for example, or with uh, 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 virus vector, yeah. There could be some differences between uh, them uh, in, in terms of responses, yeah, the binding response as well as uh, neutralizing response. Okay, now uh, a little bit about the neutralizing antibody, why we are uh, uh, discussing neutralizing antibody. This is just a schematic diagram on uh, how the neutralizing antibody works, yeah, if the antibody uh, bind specifically to the RBD and then uh, it will immobilize the virus, of course, and uh, of course, after uh, being neutralized by the antibody, the virus cannot enter the cell. Yeah, and then further, it will be processed by the phagocyte. So that's, that's why uh, uh, it is important to know whether we have the neutralizing antibody in sufficient level or not. Okay, so uh, the purpose of uh, measure, measuring the post-vaccination neutralizing antibody is, uh, of course, we could uh, ascertain whether it, the antibody is formed, yeah, uh, and then also the level is quite protective, and then also uh, we could determine how long the protection will last and uh, determine uh, whether we need uh, booster vaccination. And of course, uh, 
in the clinical trial uh, phase three or uh, phase four, we could use this uh, approach to measure the vaccine effectiveness. Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, uh, the same uh, method uh, could be used to measure antibody level in survivors. Yeah. Uh, if we would like to use their plasma, uh, convalescent plasma, uh, to help uh, other other people who is uh, suffering from uh, COVID-19 infection. Okay, uh, I uh, take I took uh, one table from the a paper published by uh, Lee et al. in uh, yeah, last year. He compared the uh, result of PRNT test and uh, ELISA. Uh, yeah, in this table, we could see that, uh, for example, this is the uh, number of PRNT uh, tested, yeah, and this is uh, uh, a level of antibody yeah, by PRNT, less than 80, 80, 160, and more than 320, yeah. Uh, and this, uh, the first column, uh, represent the result of uh, LSI titer, yeah, titer. So we could see that if the uh, uh, LSI titer uh, uh, is low, yeah, also uh, PRNT, uh, yeah, uh, the PRNT is also quite low, yeah. If the uh, PRNT result it's quite high, for example, they are higher than, than uh, 320, then uh, the ELISA also could detect a uh, high uh, titer. Yeah. This is, uh, of course, for PRNT 50 and PRNT 90. Uh, if we look at this uh, PRNT 90, uh, it is more, uh, actually more, um, we could we could say it's more more sensitive. I mean, uh, it could uh, differentiate yeah uh, between uh, a low level and a high level. So we could see uh, if we uh, uh, measure the PRNT ninety, uh, the ELISA yeah um, could detect only if the titer is uh, quite high. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, if we are talking about PRNT, we understand that PRNT is uh, uh, considered as gold standard yeah, for measuring the level of an neutralizing antibody. This is a, a, a so-called standard method, but uh, the procedure is quite uh, tedious and time-consuming, uh, and uh, it requires a, a high biosafety uh, uh, level facilities and also uh, expensive yeah um, time consuming as an expensive but again it is the good standard yeah I will not uh, talk in detail about the, the procedure yeah um, just in brief uh, sorry just in brief uh, we compare um uh, the level of virus entering the cell yeah usually we uh, use uh, a particular cell uh, as, as a target and then uh, we infect with the uh, uh, virus and then uh, we add uh, antibody in serial dilution so we could see the uh, the result as uh, see from this next slide no, sorry oh yeah later I will uh, I will show you um, because of that uh, procedure uh, that requiring uh, high level uh, by safety uh, facilities uh, many uh, people are trying to uh, use a safer uh, procedure 
by using not the pathogen uh, path pathogenic virus, but uh, instead uh, use the so-called uh, pseudotype virus. Yeah, in this case, we could use uh, HIV for HIV pseudotype or it, uh, uh, vesicular uh, virus, vesicular stomata, this uh, virus, yeah, uh, pseudotype, yeah. Uh, but already uh, modified that uh, they have the spike protein uh, on the surface. Yeah, uh, SARS coronavirus 2 spike. Yeah. So we we could use this procedure uh, um, in just uh, BSL2, common BSL2 facilities. We don't need the BSL3 facilities. The result is quite com comparable. Okay, this is just uh, an example of uh, uh, a setting yeah, developed by uh, uh, a company yeah, uh, to test uh, neutralizing antibody, uh, but uh, using different techniques. Uh, in this case, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, this. Sorry. Yeah, uh, they uh, uh, code the uh, uh, matrix with uh, RBD, yeah, and then um, it will uh, detect, of course, the uh, antibody. Yeah, if antibody present, it antibody will bind to the H uh, two. Now, uh, if uh, there is no neutralizing antibody, uh, the H2 uh, molecule will bind to the RBD and there will be no, uh, oh, sorry, there will be a signal. But if there is uh, no neutralizing antibody, it will bind to the H2 uh, molecule, then uh, the H2 molecule cannot bind to the RBD. So there will be no signal. So uh, then uh, this could be compared. Yeah. Uh, of course, this is uh, the negative result, yeah, showing that there is no uh, neutralizing antibody. But this is the positive result uh, when the neutralizing antibody is present. Uh, okay. Uh, some other uh, company also uh, develop uh, other methods yeah, using the chemiluminescent uh, approach uh, to detect and measure also the neutralizing antibody. Yeah. Uh, because of uh, time limitation, I uh, will just uh, try to go faster. Uh, <clears throat> so what we did in our laboratory yeah, is to uh, try to compare between uh, uh, two platforms. So one is uh, uh, for PRNT as the standard, and the other platform is uh, the newer uh, developed method. Uh, either it is uh, the so-called uh, SVNT, yeah? uh, the uh, surrogate VN, uh, VNT viral neutralization test, or other other platform. So far, uh, yeah, currently we receive a request from four or five uh, companies that develop uh, the uh, surrogate test for measuring the neutralizing antibody. Yeah. So in, in principle, uh, we have to answer, uh, I'm sorry, this is in, written in Bahasa Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, we have to measure uh, the Tighter of uh, antibody, yeah, specific antibody that could uh, neutralize, neutralize the SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, the antibody could be from the vaccinated uh, uh, person, individual, or uh, those uh, recovered from the infection. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is uh, what I promised before. Uh, to give you some picture of uh, what happened in the in the laboratory. So in, in principle, we, we grow uh, a cell uh, and then uh, we infect the cell with the virus and then we add 
uh, antibody in serial dilution. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for example, this the first uh, mm -hmm. line just uh, represent a, a healthy individual. So there is no antibody. Yeah. So we could see. Uh, yeah, this is the, this is the serial dilution of the, the uh, antibody. Uh, now uh, we uh, use uh, uh, plasma from uh, individual recovery from uh, COVID-19. Yeah. This is from severe case. You could see that uh, the titer is quite high. Yeah, 640. Uh, that means that uh, even after uh, dilution, yes, 340 times, it still have uh, the ability to uh, inhibit the virus from infecting the uh, cells. Yeah. We compare with the uh, mild uh, symptom case, yeah, the titer of antibody is only 20. Yeah. So with this approach, uh, we could uh, compare actually, but uh, we understand also that uh, this, this procedure is quite tedious. We have to make serial dilution, at least eight dilution. We have to grow the cell, we have to grow the virus, and then uh, we have to infect the, the cell with the virus. Yeah, and everything should be should be done in biosafety level three facilities. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we want to uh, find uh, other method, or we call it surrogate uh, method, yeah, as alternative to PRNT. Of course, uh, still PRNT uh, considered as the standard or, or good standard. Yeah? But we need to uh, find another method uh, that could give result in shorter time and also uh, safer and also cheaper, yeah? more economical. Okay. So this is uh, what we uh, did. We we validate uh, some of some platforms, either Elisa, uh, chemiluminescent assay, and also uh, uh, those using the lateral flow assay or immunochromatography. Yeah. And the result, uh, yeah, in brief, so far we. To see that uh, this is the uh, log PRNT yeah, result, uh, PRNT 50, and this is the uh, SVNT, yeah, circuit viral neutralization test. So we could see the, the, the line yeah, here. Um, the line represents the correlation between uh, log PRNT and log uh, optical density uh, 450 yeah, uh, when we do the SVNT. Yeah, so far uh, the correlation is quite good and also uh, when we assess the difference between PRNT and SVNT uh, by uh, blend Altman plot also it shows a, a good uh, correlation yeah with a 95% confidence interval yeah and uh, of course we we did find some outliers, but only happened in the low uh, title samples. So the the uh, interpretation interpretation from this result is uh, the SVNT could represent the PRNT with minimal bias. Yeah, uh, yeah, only in sample with low titer. Um, Regarding the sensitivity and also specificity, we could see from this uh, table. Yeah, uh, uh, this is the the, the uh, conclusion. The sensitivity is 100%. Specificity is uh, about 79%, uh, and uh, positive predictive value is uh, 96%, and negative predictive value is. Uh, uh, 14%. So from that, uh, you could see that the accuracy is about uh, 96%, and uh, yeah, this is about the prevalence is uh, 85%, something. 
Yes, it is uh, the result of uh, our uh, uh, observation. And um, yeah, we did also uh, check the possibility of cross uh, reactivity yeah, between uh, those yeah, PRNT50 as well as SVNT uh, to uh, other viral infection. Yeah, so we compare with uh, other infection that uh, other virus uh, that could uh, cause uh, fibra illness, adenovirus, local virus, AMV, and then coronavirus uh, OC43, and then uh, also dengue virus, influenza A, rhinovirus, and also uh, RSV A and B. And the result is, uh, hey, yes. Uh, the results show that there is no uh, cross reactivity. Okay, uh, this is my last slide, just showing um, in uh, plasma convalescent study. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry, right, sorry. Okay, yeah. Uh, we compare uh, three groups of uh, patient, a mild uh, case and uh, moderate case and severe case. Yeah, uh, this is the uh, percent of ne neutralizing virus. Yeah, we could see that uh, it could uh, differentiate between uh, uh, mild case and uh, moderate and severe case. Yeah, this. This is the, the uh, correlation, yeah. So uh, with by measuring this level of antibody, actually we could help the clinician decide uh, what we should do to the patient, yeah. Whether it should be uh, uh, isolated, yeah, or should be treated without ventilator, or uh, we have to be careful because uh, uh, the case is considered as a severe case. Okay, I think that's uh, I could uh, share with you this morning. I hope uh, you could uh, uh, receive, uh, yes, a little bit uh, first, of course, uh, refreshing and then also information about uh, the comparison between uh, the platforms. Uh, I could uh, in just inform you that currently uh, we have uh, actually the data, but since we are preparing uh, the data for the publication, so uh, we cannot show the detailed data in this uh, event. So hopefully you could uh, enjoy the the publication soon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Prof. Amin. Your very interesting lecture. Uh, Prof. Amin uh, talks about different types of antibodies in, induc in induction of antibodies by infection and vaccination. Also about post-vaccination neutralizing antibody measurement using for, and uh, there are another method for detection and also uh, about surrogate method alternative for uh, PRNT. And also there are a lot of uh, experience about plasma convalescence for donor. Oh, thank you, uh, Prof. Amin. So now uh, we'd like to invite uh, Dr. Claire Chen, PhD. He, she is expert for diagnostic tests, uh, especially for immunology from Abbott Diagnostic in Singapore. And uh, she would like to explain to us about the role of antibody testing in vaccine uses. So your time is 30 minutes also, uh, Dr. Claire. Please, the time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Lia, and uh, thank you, Prof. Amin, for the great um, presentation. Uh, let me just share. Uh, you you can see my screen, right? Yes, it's very clear. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, thanks, um, the committee, for um, giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, some scientific updates um, uh, in relation to the role of serology testing in the COVID-19 vaccine users. 
So um, I'd like to start uh, with uh, the disclaimers uh, that the views and uh, the users demonstrated in this presentation may not always reflect the current um, approved or authorized intended use or claims of the products and assays. And uh, these are uh, presented and represent best practices and the published studies and also the scientific opinions of uh, the speaker. So um, we are already one and a half year uh, into the uh, COVID pandemic. And um, we have seen a lot of uh, infection cases in many countries. And this is you know, definitely um, in fact, uh, uh, affecting uh, our day-to-day our -day life, right? And uh, many countries um, in the world are, are working very hard um, to roll out the vaccine vaccination program. And because uh, this COVID and the vaccination is still quite new, so uh, there are still a lot of questions flying around uh, regarding the COVID-19 um, situation and the vaccination um, program. Uh, some of uh, the frequently asked, uh, asked questions um, um, actually are listed here. For example, uh, what levels of antibody uh, uh, were you know, um, elicited by uh, the vaccines and what is the durability of um, those you know, um, immune response um, in individuals uh, followed, right? And then the second question is, um, does everybody have the same immune response uh, to vaccines and what is, you know, uh, the, uh, what is the uh, uh, impact of the age and the immune condition from individuals? And of course, uh, there are other questions like uh, for the vaccination, uh, you know, uh, process, right? Uh, some people have already been vaccinated, uh, sorry, some people have already been infected before and some people were not exposed. So what is the impact of uh, the previous uh, infection to the um, antibody response to the vaccines, right? And what could be uh, the implications, um, you know, uh, it, can have uh, for the vaccine uh, distribution and the deployment. And um, as Prof. Amin um, just you know, explained to us, there are um, binding uh, antibody assays and also the neutralizing antibody assays. So in the uh, uh, antibody um, monitoring for the um, vaccination, right? Should we use the uh, commercially um, available binding antibody assays or use um, the neutralizing antibody assays? And um, the last question I listed here actually is the most um, important question um, that are being asked a lot. Um, it's regarding the quantitative threshold um, that could indicate some kind of a protective level or the immunity, um, which can you know, uh, scientifically uh, inform the vaccine uh, administration. So um, there are a lot of uh, studies, uh, you know, uh, around those questions, and uh, a lot of articles also published uh, uh, in uh, attempt to address those questions. So in my presentation today, I tried to, you know, um, put together those study data and in, you know, um, attempt to um, address um, uh, some of these questions, or if not all of these questions. Now, uh, I'll start with the first question, uh, what levels of antibody response are uh, elicited by the vaccines? So we know there are different uh, types of vaccines. Uh, for example, the mRNA va vaccines are like Pfizer, uh, Moderna vaccines, um, the AstraZeneca vac vaccine, which is based on the viral vector, and also uh, the, the uh, Sinovac um, vaccine, which is based on inactivated um, uh, virus, right? So different um, type of uh, vaccines will actually um, generate a different uh, antibody response. Uh, we, uh, I, th I think, you know, we um, more or less know that. And I'm going to show you um, uh, some of the, the publications and the data of two different vaccines. Um, I'll start with the mRNA vaccines. So this is the study uh, published by Bradley et al. Uh, from uh, the University of uh, Washington. And um, they um, did a longitudinal uh, monitoring to the uh, uh, IgG uh, antibody uh, as measured by Abbott um, uh, IgG2 quantitative assay, as well as the total uh, RBD antibody um, as measured by Roche assay and also um, the antibody matched by uh, the Euroimmune assays. 
So this is um, uh, from uh, the vaccine needs are from um, the Pfizer vaccine, and therefore the first dose was given um, uh, here, and the second dose was given uh, three weeks after the first dose. And as you can see here uh, from the, you know, the IgG data from uh, Abbott um, assay, uh, after the first dose, uh, three weeks uh, after, right, we, we're seeing uh, the elevation of uh, the IgG um, after the first dose. And then uh, um, two weeks, uh, one or two weeks after the second dose, um, actually, uh, we're seeing uh, the peak of uh, antibody, IgG antibodies uh, uh, at fifth week, um, which is at, at about uh, 22,000 uh, AU per ml, and then uh, it stabilized uh, a bit and the declined a bit. Um, this similar pattern uh, was also observed uh, by using the total antibody uh, assay by Roche, but um, since uh, the Roche total, body, uh, total antibody assay actually has a narrower um, measurement range, so we uh, we're seeing, you know, uh, the increase of uh, the total antibody uh, uh, titers, uh, but um, it didn't, you know, we didn't see uh, the change actually uh, after the uh, week four, and also uh, the similar pattern was also seen uh, by the Euroimmune um, uh, antibody assays. Therefore, uh, we can see that uh, the immune response was uh, observed uh, with the first dose um, vaccination. Uh, this is actually referred to the mRNA vaccine. And um, it, it, it was further enhanced after the second dose booster. Then uh, what about uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine that, that is being used uh, in uh, Indonesia now? Um, there, there are uh, some studies, uh, but unfortunately, I didn't see, um, you know, the, uh, the, the full uh, study about, about um, the two doses um, AstraZeneca. So this is the study actually um, for the antibody uh, level after one dose of uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. And um, the uh, investigators, they, lo they look at two groups of uh, vaccine needs. So the first group uh, were those uh, infected before, and after they recovered, right, they received uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, so this is actually uh, the longitudinal uh, data after one dose of uh, AstraZeneca vaccine for those previously infected. And you can see a good uh, response of, of IgG as measured by our um, Abbott IgG2 assay. And uh, the median uh, of the IgG uh, uh, after the uh, first dose uh, is about 10,000 uh, AU per ml with the IQR, uh, which is the interquartile um, range uh, from 5,000 uh, to 17,000 AU per ml. The second group uh, are those people who were not infected before. So um, those, you know, who were not infected before, they also received uh, one dose of uh, AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. But um, for this uh, group, right, uh, actually uh, the IgG response um, uh, after one dose uh, is not uh, as uh, strong as those group. So the median uh, IgG is only 435 AU per ml uh, with the IQR from 200 to uh, about uh, 1000 AU per ml. So you can see here that the level of IgG uh, for this group uh, is much lower than this group as well as um, the level from the mRNA uh, uh, vaccine. Um, and therefore, you know, we can see that the lower titers um, as compared to those from the mRNA vaccines and for the people who were not infected before, uh, we highly uh, recommend two doses of um, the AstraZeneca vaccine because um, the antibody, um, the IgG antibody response uh, after one dose uh, is not uh, strong enough. Now, um, the third type of the vaccine are uh, from the Sinovac, which is also being used quite heavily in Indonesia. So what is uh, the uh, antibody response uh, to the Sinovac? Uh, this is from uh, the study from Hong Kong University, where very fresh study actually uh, this article was uh, published just two days ago. Um, so um, the, the investigators actually compare um, the IgG um, uh, as measured by our uh, Abbott IgG quantitative assay uh, for the Sinovac uh, vaccines um, after one dose, after two dose, 
um, compared with uh, those people vaccinated by the Pfizer vaccine, uh, one dose, two dose. They also measured uh, the total uh, antibody, uh, RBD antibody as measured by the Roche assay, as well as the surrogate uh, neutralizing antibodies as measured by the GenScript uh, SVMT assay. So we can see here that uh, from the IgG um, uh, titers uh, as measured by uh, Abbott assay, uh, after one dose of uh, the uh, Sinovac um, uh, vaccine, actually um, some of them actually were below our cutoff um, uh, at 50 AU per ml, and uh, the mean level is about 157 uh, AU per ml. But after uh, the second dose, uh, almost all of them, actually 99% of the recipients, um, their uh, antibody level um, is above um, the, the cutoff at uh, 50 AU per ml with the mean value uh, at uh, about 1000 AU per ml. Um, this is uh, lower than um, the um, Pfizer vaccine as expected, um, but um, you know, still, you know, uh, or almost all of them actually developed uh, the IgG, and the similar pattern was also see um, was also seen on the uh, total antibody assay um, by Roche, as well as uh, the surrogate neutralizing antibody um, assay by the transcript assay. So we, we also um, saw the similar pattern here on the other two assays. So uh, uh, as I mentioned, 99% uh, of the uh, uh, Sinovac uh, recipients actually uh, developed uh, the uh, IgG and the 94% actually developed the surrogate neutralizing antibodies. Um, the, uh, in terms of the IgG title, uh, it's about uh, 1 uh, 11 uh, that of uh, uh, the uh, Pfizer uh, recipients. Now, um, what did we learn from these uh, studies? Uh, so what the, uh, those studies actually told us, um, I guess the key message is that um, despite uh, the vaccine types, antibody response uh, was observed with the first um, dose uh, vaccination and the booster with the second dose uh, vaccination. Um, so to the clinical labs, um, uh, and of hospitals, um, because you know, for some vaccines, actually, uh, we are seeing quite strong uh, antibody uh, response to the uh, to the vaccines, especially after the second uh, dose booster, right? So, um, if uh, you could choose an antibody test with a wide measurement range, uh, that's quite beneficial because uh, you don't have to do a further dilution. Uh, so we can have a more uh, first pass results. Um, this will drive uh, a greater operation um, efficiency by eliminating repeat, repeat, repeat runs. Now the second question, uh, what is the durability of the SARS-CoV-2 antibody? Um, we are one and a half year uh, into the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but uh, the vaccination history uh, is still quite short. Uh, I believe uh, the earliest you know, uh, vaccination program uh, in the world actually started from uh, the December, uh, January um, you know, period. Therefore, uh, the durability uh, or longitudinal uh, data for uh, after the vaccination uh, is still limited. But uh, for the uh, durability data, uh, post-infection actually uh, we have seen um, uh, quite a bit. So I'm starting with um, the, the longitudinal data of the antibodies uh, post-infection. So this study was published on uh, the journal Science. On, uh, they are looking at uh, the immunological uh, memory to the SARS-CoV-2 for up to uh, eight months after infection. And um, uh, this group of the infect, uh, investigators, they actually measure the circulating antibodies uh, as well as the memory B cells, uh, the CD4 and the CDT, uh, CD8 T cells, uh, specific, uh, the SARS, uh, specific for SARS-CoV-2 um, in a, a group of uh, the recoverers from, you know, a different uh, severity of the disease, right? So, as you can see in this chart, um, they observed a declining trend of uh, the IgG antibodies to the spike protein uh, over the eight year, uh, sorry, over the eight months uh, after the recovery, but still um, uh, the IgG uh, antibodies after the um, eight months uh, of the infection is still quite um, elevated and strong, and. Um, 
they also saw uh, the similar trend uh, on the neutralizing antibody titers also, you know, uh, declining, but uh, still uh, at the end of the eight months, uh, the, the antibody level is uh, elevated. However, they saw a great uh, heterogeneity uh, between individuals, um, you know, with the antibody response, um, which could differ uh, uh, almost 200, um, uh, you know, uh, difference um, times of the difference uh, between the individuals. And this is another set of the data um, published recently about um, the, the post-infection uh, antibody response. And uh, this actually uh, is even longer. So uh, the researchers actually look at uh, one year uh, worth of the data after infection, uh, months are 11 to months are 13, right? So what they saw is um, the antibodies uh, to the nuclear capsid um, uh, uh, protein actually declined. Uh, faster than the antibodies uh, to the uh, uh, spike protein. So you can see here on the right hand side, um, the declining trend is uh, more steep uh, than uh, the uh, uh, antibodies to the spike uh, protein. Um, and for the anti-spike uh, protein antibodies, right? Uh, actually, uh, most majority of uh, the individuals still had positive um, anti-spike um, uh, protein. Uh, IgG of, uh, antibodies are uh, at uh, one year uh, post the infection. So this is also measured by uh, our Abbott IgG uh, assay. Now, uh, what about uh, the antibody response or the durability uh, for the vaccines? Um, so uh, the data is still quite limited, uh, but um, you know uh, uh, there are actually a quite uh, a couple of data actually are published by Moderna. So uh, this is uh, the six months um, post vaccination data uh, published by Moderna. This is after the second dose of uh, Moderna vaccine, and um, they. Um, Look at uh, the um, uh, antibody um, to the uh, RBD uh, six months after the second dose, and you can see the uh, curve here that uh, the the antibody to the uh, RBD right uh, actually also decline over time. But uh, after six months, um, you know uh, uh, of um, the second dose, uh, we are still seeing a, a decent amount of um, antibody um, uh, six months after. And also, uh, they uh, look at uh, the uh, PRNT uh, data uh, six months after the second dose, and also a similar pattern was seen. So we are still seeing a, a, a good, a decent uh, amount of the uh, neutralizing antibodies. Um, they are also uh, looking at um, the uh, neutralizing antibodies uh, six to eight months uh, after the second dose of the Moderna to different variants. And this is quite interesting data. Um, so they look at uh, the neutralizing antibody titer uh, to the three type of uh, variants, uh, the D614G, uh, which is one of the earliest variant. And then the second variant um, uh, from, um, uh, you know, originated from South Africa and the third variant originated from Brazil. So we can see that uh, after six to eight months, um, actually uh, the neutralizing antibody titer to the um, D614G, uh, right, is still, you know, uh, quite uh, above um, uh, the um, uh, level, uh, which they said is uh, very likely are uh, still protective. Unfortunately, to the two types of the variants, um, uh, the, the South uh, Africa variant and the Brazil uh, variant, right, um, the neutralizing antibody level actually is below uh, the limit of quantification. So um, these two um, levels, um, uh, you know, um, are a bit concerning. So what is the key message uh, we um, learned from uh, these studies? Um, so we know that uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies are uh, induced by either infection or vaccination uh, will decline over time. Therefore, it is important to understand uh, if we still have sufficient antibodies um, to protect us. And also, uh, this will lead to some other questions. For example, do we need a third dose booster? Because I know some countries uh, study um, uh, are already, you know, um, um, considering doing it. 
And if we need a third dose booster, when is the good time um, to do the third do, uh, dose booster? So we um, we all you know need to make this decision based on the um, um, uh, antibody or immune data. Um, uh, out on that. Now the third question: um, Does everybody have uh, the same immune response to vaccines? So is there any? Uh, impact from uh, the conditions like uh, age, uh, your immune condition. So let's look at uh, in the impact of uh, the age uh, first. Uh, this is um, the study from a, a group of Greek uh, researchers. So they look at the impact of age uh, on the uh, IgG uh, titers uh, after you know, the, the um, uh, Pfizer vaccine. And um, as you can see here, we can see a declining uh, trend uh, of the IgG uh, titer, um, uh, you know, uh, depending on the age. And the, the, the investigators said that um, specifically for the age group of uh, 50 plus, 50 years old um, and above, especially for the group, um, you know, um, 60 years uh, and older, right? They are seeing a, a significant, um, you know, um, uh, uh, reduced um, IgG as compared to the younger group. So there is actually a, a significant uh, impact of age, especially for the elderly group, regarding uh, the uh, antibody response to the vaccine. And then what about those uh, immune compromised, uh, compromised uh, people, right? So we, are, we are actually have, uh, you know, those uh, immune compromised uh, people around us. And this study um, from US, uh, they look at uh, 73, uh, those immune compromised people, uh, specifically uh, those lung transplant uh, patients. And as you can see here that um, on this chart um, on the left-hand side, um, the, this is uh, the IgG uh, title as measured by our um, IgG assay from uh, the healthy um, uh, recipients of uh, the vaccines. So um, the, there is a very decent uh, IgG response after the uh, Pfizer vaccine. But for those lung transplant patients, even after two doses of uh, the Pfizer vaccine, the median level of IgG is only 1.7 AU per ml, which is very minimal uh, as compared to uh, the median level of uh, 14,000 uh, AU per ml from uh, the healthy um, uh, recipients. And uh, they also found, uh, you know, uh, uh, about one quarter uh, of those lung transplant patients, uh, they generate um, the positive um, response following uh, the two doses of vaccine, but uh, three quarters, they didn't actually um, generate uh, the, the IgG response. Um, they, they also did a small comparison between Pfizer and the Moderna, and they found a Moderna formulation seems to uh, generate uh, a slightly higher uh, response to those um, you know, uh, lung transplant uh, patients. Um, so this is actually from the recent news. Uh, they are seeing uh, almost uh, 3% of, you know, um, people in the uh, U.S. are taking those uh, immune weakening drugs that may limit uh, the uh, uh, vaccine response. And they are seeing, uh, you know, they said, you know, they realize uh, those people that are taking the immune uh, weakening drugs, they may have a slower response uh, to the, the vaccine. And in some people, they probably won't uh, respond at all. Therefore, they said, you know, for those uh, group of the uh, people which are at risk, you need to be um, paying a special uh, attention. So the message uh, from these studies is really that, um, you know, um, the vaccine response actually uh, vary from individual to uh, individual. Not all uh, immune response are created uh, equally, right? So for those at-risk populations, uh, for example, those elderly people and also those uh, immune compromised people, uh, they have a varying va uh, level of response. And in some cases, they probably won't have uh, uh, antibody response at all. Therefore, uh, understanding of their antibody levels uh, can help you know, uh, inform the epidemiological uh, strategies and help uh, protect uh, those people uh, better. Now, uh, next question, uh, what is the impact of uh, the prior infection on vaccine response? Because for the vaccine uh, receive, uh, recipients, uh, some of them may have uh, been exposed before. So what, what is the impact of uh, the prior 
fire exposure. In this uh, study, actually, um, the, the investigators look at uh, the impact of the prior infection uh, on the vaccination. So um, on the left hand side, um, these are the people who were not exposed before, who were not infected before. And on the right hand side, uh, these are the people who were uh, infected before. So you can see here, uh, after the first dose are from those uh, infection naive people, there is uh, uh, antibody uh, IgG uh, uh, elevation after the first dose, but um, at you know a uh, 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 level of um, 1,000 AU per ml. But after the second dose, uh, there is a big jump. Um, you know um, after uh, the second dose with the IgG level. However. For those people who were infected before, um, after the first dose, um, the, the IgG level is already uh, uh, about the same level or even higher uh, with those people um, after the second dose who were not infected before. And for those uh, previously infected people, the second dose of Pfizer actually uh, didn't uh, elevate uh, the IgG further. So you can see uh, the level of uh, the first dose and uh, the second dose are about the same. A similar um, observation was uh, also observed uh, from this Greek uh, study, you know, uh, for, from those who were, not, not, who were not infected before. And who were not uh, infected before, so you, you, you can see uh, the uh, difference between uh, those people who were not infected before and infected before. Therefore, um, the key message from uh, uh, these you know, um, studies are uh, the single dose of vaccine may already provoke you know, a good, decent uh, level of immunity that is comparable to that um, seen from those uh, infection naive people. And therefore, a single dose uh, for those uh, previously infected individuals may uh, accelerate um, achieving a faster in, uh, herd immunity, especially for the countries you know, uh, with uh, the limited uh, vaccine uh, supply. So uh, these uh, study findings have already been translated uh, into the strategies uh, in some countries, for example, Spain, uh, in uh, Italy, uh, in Germany, uh, they all uh, implemented uh, these uh, strategy. Now, uh, the next question is about, uh, you know, in the monitoring of the antibodies or, or serologies uh, after vaccination, should we use the neutralizing antibodies? Uh, neutralizing antibody assays or the commercially uh, available um, uh, binding antibody assays. Prof. Amin actually give a very good uh, explanation between uh, the difference, um, you know, the difference between these two assays. Um, so I fully agree uh, with what he said, you know, in his presentation that uh, the neutralizing antibodies are truly those functional antibodies uh, to block the virus from uh, infecting the people. Uh, I won't go into the details as Prof. Amin has already explained. Uh, and um, uh, I'd just like to share with you this uh, recent research um, that, you know, uh, showing the neutralizing antibody levels are highly predictive of uh, the immune protection from uh, the, the uh, symptomatic uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 inf um, infection, which was published on Nature uh, very recently. So um, they actually um, collected the clinical trial data from uh, different vaccines uh, from uh, like the Sinovac, um, uh, the Pfizer uh, vaccine, um, you know, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, the Moderna vaccine. So they use um, their um, uh, efficacy data, the protective efficacy data, as well as the neutralizing antibody data normalized against um, the recovered patients and they built up this model and they found a very strong correlation between the neutralizing antibody, um, uh, you know, titers uh, or, you know, the neutralizing antibody uh, against the, the covalescent uh, patients uh, with the uh, protective uh, efficacy. So they found that, you know, the stronger uh, the neutralizing antibodies are uh, you will have a stronger uh, protective efficacy. Therefore, um, you know, um, ideally we should use um, the neutralizing antibody assays uh, to, you know, monitor the efficacy of the vaccine. However, in real, 
reality, actually, uh, the, the, the challenge is really uh, for the neutralizing antibodies. Uh, we only know that um, the only uh, gold standard for the neutralizing antibody uh, testing is the PRMT um, test as uh, uh, explained by um, Prof. Ali just now, right? But PRMT is very manual, as you heard from Prof. Ali, and it requires the uh, biosafety level um, three facility and uh, the highly skilled uh, lab personnel, and it's also very um, time consuming. Even if you know uh, you use those uh, pseudo uh, type uh, virus uh, for the you know for the neutralizing uh, uh, antibody assays, uh, it's still uh, very manual and require uh, a lot of time. Therefore, if you can use a, a commercially um, automatic uh, binding assay with a good uh, correlation with the PRMT, then uh, it may be used as a surrogate assay to predict uh, the neutralizing anti uh, antibody levels. So uh, I just want to uh, quickly share with you our um, uh, concordance data between our IgG2 assay with uh, the PRMT uh, assay. So um, uh, in, this is actually um, presented uh, in our package insert. Um, uh, in you know, the, this um, um, study, right, they, they took uh, 86 uh, positive um, uh, results from uh, the PRMT. Um, as tested by all IgG2, and all uh, 86 actually also turned out to be uh, positive on our IgG2 uh, assay. So we actually achieved 100% agreement between our IgG2 assay with the PRMT assay. And uh, this is the quantitative correlation between our IgG2 assay result uh, versus uh, the PRMT titers. And uh, you know you can see actually a good correlation between our IgG2 titer versus uh, versus uh, the PRNT titer. And um, uh, specifically, um, if we are talking about this one to two hundred uh, fifty uh, titer of the PRNT, which is considered as a higher uh, level of um, the PRNT or the neutralizing antibody level, um, the IgG uh, result from our IgG2 assay is about four thousand hundred sixty uh, AU per ml. And again, um, also this is uh, available from our package insert. Um, we predict um, the probability or the confidence of um, our IgG2 assay in predicting uh, the high level of um, the neutralizing antibody um, assay, uh, neutralizing uh, antibody levels. So you can see that uh, when the uh, IgG result increases, uh, the probability or the confidence to predict the high title of the neutralizing antibody also increases. And uh, at the level of 4,160 AU per ml, uh, the probability or the confidence to predict the high title of a PI and NT is 95%. And your time is just only five minutes more. Okay, yeah, sure, I'll <laughs> uh, expedite. So um, this is actually uh, from uh, the recent study. Uh, they actually established uh, the correlation between the, the PRNT uh, versus um, our IgG titer um, against the three type of uh, the variants, um, you know, the D614 G variant, uh, the, uh, this, this is UK variant, and this is uh, the South Africa variant. And if you look at um, the uh, correlation coefficient, uh, they are all very high, above 0 0.9, and, um, you know, the, the, the slope and um, the, the uh, intercept is here. So you can see, um, you know, very um, good correlation between the PRNT and our, our IgG result. And this is uh, from another study on the, on the uh, correlation between, between our IgG level versus uh, the transcript uh, SBNT level, and also a good correlation uh, with the R square uh, above zero point. So uh, the key message uh, is really, you know, uh, uh, ideally we should use uh, the neutralizing antibody assay, but uh, in reality, uh, there are a lot of uh, challenges. Therefore, if you can use a good, um, if you can use a, a commercially um, uh, automated uh, assay, uh, the binding assay, uh, with a good correlation with the neutralizing uh, antibody test, um, then uh, it can be used as a surrogate to uh, predict the neutralization. Now, the last question, uh, is there any uh, quantitative antibody threshold or cutoff uh, that can be used to um, indicate uh, the protective level 
Uh, I guess a lot of people are asking this question. But unfortunately, uh, at this stage, there is still no consensus uh, uh, threshold of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 antibody um, you know, uh, to indicate a protective level or immunity level. And there are a lot of studies ongoing um, to seek the answer to it. Um, so um, there are already a couple of studies actually you know, using the neutralizing uh, antibody levels to, um, to suggest that certain neutralizing antibody levels may predict um, certain you know, protection level. I'm going to share with you uh, a couple of studies here. Um, so this is actually the study um, published on uh, Nature very recently. Again, you, they use the clinical data uh, from uh, different vaccines um, uh, regarding the neutralizing antibody levels uh, versus the protective efficacy. And uh, the authors uh, said that they suggested that, you know, the neutralization level for 50% uh, protect, protection against uh, the detectable or symptomatic uh, infection, uh, they suggest, um, you know, this 20% of uh, the mean covalent level uh, would be able to um, indicate a 50% uh, protection uh, 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 effic efficacy. So for those um, people who, you know, uh, uh, protect from uh, the severe infection, actually um, the required uh, neutralization level would be even lower. So they suggest actually 3% of um, the uh, recovered uh, level could be uh, uh, the, the one that is 50% uh, against the severe infection. And in the uh, paper, they said, um, the 20% of, uh, you know, this uh, covalent level actually is uh, equivalent to the PRNT level at about 1 to 10 to 1 to 30. Um, this is from another uh, paper. They actually um, did a correlation between uh, our uh, Abbott IgG uh, result versus the neutralizing uh, antibody uh, uh, level against the three types of um, the variants. And they said that for uh, the variant D614G and the B117, uh, which is from U UK, right? Uh, actually, um, uh, for our IgG level at 2.3 log AU per ml uh, is, you know, uh, good enough, um, uh, you know, or, uh, uh, sen sensitive enough uh, to neutralize uh, these two variants. However, for a more challenging variant, uh, this um, uh, South Africa variant, um, actually you need a higher title of IgG, uh, which is three log. Uh, AU per ml to, uh, to be able to neutralize um, this um, South Africa variant. And this is my last slide, uh, just to share with you uh, the US FDA recommendation for uh, covalent plasma, which, you know, they recommend a different cutoff value from uh, different assays. So for the uh, Abbott assay, actually, you know, they recommend 840 AU per ml to select the covalent plasma for, for change. And just uh, very quickly uh, to summarize, uh, we have seen that, you know, a, a good um, immune response from the vaccines and then for uh, the um, uh, 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 response of uh, the antibodies actually decline, um, but uh, that's why we need to uh, understand the uh, antibody levels. And then we also um, uh, talked about uh, the different uh, immune response from different individuals, especially uh, the impact from uh, the age and the immune conditions. And for those uh, previously infected people, uh, a single dose may be efficient. And for the um, monitoring, uh, ideally we should use the neutralizing antibody assays, but uh, it's uh, challenging, you know, in terms of uh, different uh, realistic uh, factors. Therefore, uh, a good um, uh, binding uh, antibody assay with a good re uh, relationship uh, with the neutralizing antibodies could be used. And um, also uh, researchers are ongoing um, to seek the answer of uh, the cutoff um, level for the protective uh, uh, level of uh, the uh, immunity. Um, that's all from my uh, presentation. Thank you all for the uh, attention. Thank you.